Hello, I'm Kendall House, and this presentation is called What are the Limits of Indirect Reciprocity? In this presentation, we'll answer two big questions. One, what is indirect reciprocity? And second, is there a size limit to achieving cooperation through indirect reciprocity? So there are two kinds of reciprocities that are commonly discussed in evolutionary anthropology. One of these is called direct reciprocity, and this is where benefits flow between pairs of partners back and forth. So we've discussed this repeatedly, but now we're going to look at indirect reciprocity, where the rewards come from third-party observers of a generous act. So now it's not the case that we're worried about blue reciprocating orange's generosity, but rather the reward will come from a third party represented by purple in this diagram. And we've discussed why direct reciprocity would seem unlikely between strangers in large cities and indeed, it appears that altruistic acts between strangers in large cities are so surprising that they're newsworthy. And this was shown in November of 2012 when a tourist took a photo or a video of a New York City police officer who provided a pair of shoes to a homeless man on a cold day. And this propelled this police officer named Larry DePrimo to fame for his 15 minutes of fame. He appeared on talk shows, he received awards, and he was roundly celebrated. Now if we think about his act of generosity, it wouldn't have been that surprising to us if the man had been his nephew because we could have put it down to inclusive fitness. And it also wouldn't have been that surprising to us if he'd been an old friend, because then we could say, well, maybe it was reciprocal altruism. Uh, maybe the homeless man 10 years ago helped out his buddy, and Larry DePrimo was simply reciprocating that act. But in fact, they'd never met before. So what explains this? Well, there is a possible explanation for this kind of human behavior, and it's called indirect reciprocity. And this is where benefits come from others who observe the act. Here we see a photo of Officer DePrimo receiving a proclamation from the New York City Council. Recognizing his behavior, he also received on the New York City Police Facebook page 513,000 likes within two days. So a lot of people liked Officer DePrimo for what he did. And that might explain why humans sometimes behave in an altruistic manner when the individual receiving that altruism is very unlikely to ever reciprocate it. So what we call indirect reciprocity is all about reputation. And it was a key idea developed by Richard Alexander. You can read more about it in his book, uh, Human Social Evolution, which collects his essays. And it differs from direct reciprocity because the reciprocal donor is not the recipient of the initial generous act. So it's not blue that's reciprocating the altruism of orange, but rather it's a third party, uh, purple. And so this means that orange never needs to meet blue again. But it does mean that somehow purple has to observe the act and know that it's genuine. So when we ask the question, are there limits to indirect reciprocity? The obvious limit is how many people accurately know your reputation. And if that number is very small, then that's going to limit indirect reciprocity. We could say that it kind of exploded for Officer DePrimo, and that was because of social media. And Martin Nowak, who we've met before, has a formula for the limits of indirect reciprocity. This is on pages 102 to 103 of his book, Evolution, Games, and God, by Harvard University Press. 
And his formula is that Q must be greater than the cost-benefit ratio. And this means that Q uh, stands for the probability of accurately knowing the reputation of an altruist. And that probability of accurately knowing reputation has to exceed the ratio of the cost to the donor to the benefit of the recipient. Now, if we think about this, there are some complexities to it that we're going to pass over because time is limited. But if we think about this, the implications of it, we'll find that size of human society still matters, particularly when we take social media as a recent technology out of the picture. So in a foraging camp of 5 to 50 individuals, so in a foraging camp of 5 to 50 individuals, it wouldn't surprise us that the individuals in that camp accurately know one another's reputations. They interact many times, they observe how people treat one another, and we have to assume that reputations are well known. But between strangers in a very large metropolitan city of millions of people, how can those strangers possibly know one another's reputation accurately? and therefore be induced uh, to shower favors on individuals they observe behaving generously. So to summarize, we've discussed two roads to cooperation, kinship through inclusive fitness and exchange through reciprocity, and we've defined two kinds of reciprocity, direct and indirect, and it would appear that in Traditional human societies, societies without advanced communication technologies, all of these forms, all of these roads to cooperation and altruism would appear to work best with small numbers. But of course we know that humans have formed in the last 10,000 years very large societies. And so we have this puzzle. How is this large-scale cooperation possible? Can we explain it? And we're going to now look at new approaches that may be able to explain what inclusive fitness and reciprocity don't seem able to explain. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it.